the recording now. Okay. Well, here we are. Um, all you see is a yellow screen right now. Uh, so here I am, Jerry. You don't get to see me, but you get to see my program. And I'm glad that all you folks are here today. What we're doing is looking at what I call the Southern Humboldt Trilogy. It's three books about Southern Humboldt County that uh, were published last year. It's part of this longer series I'm doing that's called The History of Humboldt County Peoples and Places. And eventually it's going to cover the whole county and should be seven books long. But the, the ones we're going to look at today are the three for Southern Humboldt that uh, turned out that uh, I was actually trying to just do one book, but it got so long that it turned into three books. And so we'll look at a little of those today. And I'll mention right now that uh, these books are available online. If you go to the Cal Poly Humboldt Library website and then go to the press at Cal Poly, which is uh, sponsored by the library, uh, you can uh, Google my name, for example, at that point and get uh, a search a place where you can uh, actually download any of the four books that they've published for me, including these uh, three that we'll look at today. So very briefly, I'm going to uh, just take you on a tour of the books and on a tour of Southern Humboldt. And if you have questions along the way, uh, be sure to ask them because I, I like responding uh, you know, right at the time when something comes up on screen. Okay, so uh, the first book is called Southern Humboldt Indians, and uh, it covers um, six tribes from Southern Humboldt County out of the 13 named tribes that we could find uh, within the boundaries of the entire county. And uh, that's kind of an introduction to Humboldt County and the Southern areas because of course the native people were here uh, way before the whites arrived, and we uh, tried dealing with their, uh, not their culture so much, but with their history from the early days uh, first to kind of set the stage for then what happened after whites arrived. So here we have a map of Southern Humboldt County, and uh, the six tribes that we cover down there, these are the ones that if not ethnographers have uh, identified and sometimes the names aren't very uh, accurate or even correct. They certainly aren't the ones that uh, the Indians themselves called themselves. But uh, what uh, we know as the Bear River tribe, which is, as you see on this map, in the area where uh, Bear River drains out to the coast, and they also came over Bear River Ridge into the Rio Dell and Scotia area and all the way up to um, Hinesville, actually. And then south of them, uh, were the Matol Indian tribe. So another tribe named for a river, the Matol River down here. And uh, they were in uh, the lower stretches of the Matol River uh, around Petrolia and a few miles upriver from that. And then a tribe that had a very large area, the Sinkione, or sometimes called Sinkione tribe, which uh, as you can see covered, oh, almost uh, half of Southern Humboldt County and actually goes off the map into Mendocino County a little ways also. But places like Shelter Cove and uh, Garberville, um, Petrolia, all the South Fork Eel communities were uh, part of this tribe's uh, traditional territory. And we'll look a little bit about that later on. Then down in the extreme southeastern corner of Humboldt County, we have the Wailaki tribe which was mostly located in Northern Mendocino and Western Trinity County, but a little bit of their territory came through Humboldt County along the Eel River. And up above them, uh, it's down river on the Eel, the Lassic tribe. Of course, most of us have heard of the Lassic Peaks or maybe gone out and seen them. They were named for uh, Indian leader of this group whose uh, name, was, well, the name he was given was Lassic. He had an Indian name that was somewhat different, but uh, they uh, were people who occupied the Fort Seward area and up towards Blocksburg and over into Trinity County. Then the last tribe uh, in Southern Humboldt, the Nongottles, uh, also had a very large area. They were people that occupied uh, pretty much the entire drainage of the Van Dusen River 
and uh, a little bit of the Mad River and a little bit of uh, Larrabee Creek. And so if you drive out Highway 36, for example, along the Van Dusen River, you would be mostly going through Known Gaudel territory until you got uh, across the Trinity County line. Uh, now, so those are the six tribes that ethnographers have named and identified. But then if you start looking at their field notes and uh, getting additional information from what's published even, you find out that most of these groups uh, were not just tribes, they were collections of smaller uh, tribal groups. And for example, the Nongadals and the Sinkiones both had about 20 separately named groups within their territory. And if you were happen to have been back 200 years ago and could talk to one of these people and ask them, well, uh, what's the name for your people or where do you come from? Uh, they wouldn't have said, oh, I'm a known god. They would have said something like I'm a Catel Kia, or they would have other names like that for their particular area. They identify very closely just to uh, a small uh, stretch of land, usually along a river or a creek. So if we added it all up, we'd have over 50 separately named groups down here in Southern Humboldt County, not just the six tribes themselves. And that's one of the things that this uh, book on the Southern Humboldt Indians goes into. It, uh, gives the names for these tribes and describes their territory and tells a little about each of the individual groups within them. There's two uh, men that uh, were actually interviewed in the early 1900s and uh, also on into the 1910s and 20s. Uh, the man on the left is named George Burt. The man on the right was uh, called Charlie or sometimes Bryceland Charlie from the area that he lived in. And uh, they were interviewed in the early 1900s by one of the first ethnographers that came out to this area and systematically tried to collect information from the early day Indians. So, you know, whites arrived pretty much uh, as a force in Humboldt County in 1850. And we had about 15 years of what we have to call the Indian genocide, when uh, many of the Indians were deliberately killed by the whites in an attempt to gain control of the area and to reduce the Indians' power and to simply get them out of the way. But fortunately, some of the Indians managed to survive, and these two men had survived that time period. And uh, uh, in the case of George Burt went to reservations, we don't know as, as much about uh, Bryce and Charlie, but uh, they were available in the early 1900s to be interviewed by this man, Pliny Goddard, who uh, was one of the first two anthropology faculty members at UC Berkeley. Uh, the department was actually up and running about 1902, and uh, Goddard was there from about 1902 into 1908. And he worked with uh, Alfred L. Kroeber, who many of you have heard of and actually has cut a kind of wide swath across California anthropology. You might recall that a couple of years ago, his uh, name was removed from uh, the anthropology department building at UC Berkeley. Uh, there was a, quite a, a period of activity there were students and tribal members and members of the public and researchers like myself uh, urged the university to remove his name because of uh, actually the racist and cultural biases that he had that actually had a negative effect on the Indian communities rather than a positive one. Goddard, on the other hand, as near as I can tell, had a very close relationship with individual Indians and was trusted by them, respected by them, and collected a tremendous amount of information. And every summer, when he wasn't teaching down at Berkeley, he would come up into this area, mostly into Humboldt County, and uh, he would stop off at Laytonville and he would get his transportation there. He had a pack horse here on the left, and then he had a mule that he would use to ride and he'd uh, load up the pack horse and he'd saddle up the mule and he would uh, come up to Humboldt County and ride into the back country and look around for elderly inter, uh, Indians that he could interview. And he found quite a few of them and collected a tremendous amount of information. And it's thanks really to his work that we have some of the most direct 
and personal information about the Indians and their tribes in this area. And it's actually very different from what we know about the Northern Humboldt Indians, where mostly we have to take secondhand information that ethnographers have written up. And uh, actually right now I'm working on volume five in this series of books, which is uh, Northern Humboldt Indians. And it's much harder for me to do that because I have to go to people like uh, Krober, for example, who uh, interviewed Indians, but uh, we don't have his field notes and we can't find out what the Indians themselves actually said. And that's what I'm always after is to find out what the people themselves had to say before the academicians had a chance to analyze it and uh, pick and choose what they wanted to tell us. So one of the people that uh, both Goddard and uh, another uh, ethnographer uh, of Hart Miriam uh, had to say uh, about uh, the Indians up here was uh, this statement from Joe Duncan. And uh, I unfortunately misspelled sleep. He didn't oversleep. It should only be two E's in the word. But uh, Joe Duncan was a member of the Matol tribe and he lived down the, near the mouth of the Matol River. And he was here when the whites came through that area and they just cut through that area like a scythe, uh, removing the Indians as quickly as they could. It was one of the areas most hardly uh, hit very, uh, in a, in a um, well, we can only say a genocidal sort of way. Uh, the whites would massacre villages and later when they had uh, troops available, not just vigilantes, but uh, um, a military presence, they would also go back and attack Indians for years and years. So Joe was one of the few survivors that uh, made it through that time period. And when he was interviewed later by Pliny Goddard out there on the Matol, uh, one of the things he said was that I never sleep at night. He uh, very late in life, and we see him here probably about 196 or so, so about 50 years after he'd uh, uh, encountered his first uh, white people, uh, he still could not go to sleep at night. He would have, he'd be scared. He would have uh, anxiety attacks because so many bad things had happened to him. He was captured by a white man down on the Matol and uh, he was put on a horse and the fellow was going to take him back to his ranch on the North Fork of the Matol River. And uh, Joe managed to jump off the horse and run away. And uh, the slaver was uh, not able to catch him, but eventually he was captured and he spent some time on the Hooper Reservation. And I believe also on the Smith River Reservation, but was finally able to come back to Southern Humboldt and had a piece of property near the mouth of the Matol River. And uh, he had a son by the name of Ike Duncan, who was interviewed later than Joe. And it was very interesting. There was a, another ethnographer who interviewed the son, Ike, in the 1930s. And by that time, Joe uh, was dead. So all they had were the written records of what Joe had said. And this ethnographer would uh, read through those notes uh, and let uh, the son, um, Ike, hear what his father had had to say. And then uh, he'd ask, uh, the ethnographer would ask Ike, well, uh, what do you know about this or what can you tell me? And in some cases, uh, Ike would remember something about a, a particular place or a particular incident and be able to say something. But time and again, he said, well, I just don't know anything about that. And it, showed us how with a 20 year and one generation uh, time lag, uh, so much information had been lost unless you were able to uh, directly contact some of this uh, kind of first generation survivors of the Humboldt County Holocaust, uh, you lost a lot of information. And so it was really with a, a series of interviews in the 1900s, 1910s, uh, and maybe a little bit in the 1920s, that you got the information that was so important and uh, so uh, direct from what had actually happened. Well, here I'm up on the 
on the ridge between the South Fork Eel, which is down here in the valley in the background, and the main eel, which is behind me. I'm at an area called Spruce Grove, where a uh, tribal group that belonged to the uh, Sinkione tribe uh, would come up in the summertime. And uh, they lived on the east branch of the eel, uh, South Fork Eel, and also on part of the main eel down around uh, where the Benbow Inn is today, be down in this area I'm pointing to with the arrow. But in the summertime, they would come up into the prairie areas, these grasslands and oak woodlands, and uh, they would uh, actually spend several months up there. In fact, uh, the spot where I was uh, standing called Spruce Grove was one of their big campsites. And uh, one of the uh, Indians from that tribal group said it was like a picnic area. We'd all come up, have a good time, but they would also gather the acorns, they would hunt game, they would collect seeds and berries, uh, all of the things that were available to them in the summertime. And then in the fall, um, after uh, they stopped having uh, access to some of these foods, they go back down to their winter villages, which were down here on the east branch of the South Fork and on the main uh, South Fork Eel. You can see though what even today uh, is a pretty unchanged area. Uh, there's been ranching. Uh, of course, some of the wildflowers and wild species of plants have been removed. And of course, elk, things like that are no longer present, although I have seen a lot of deer down here, but uh, uh, it's turned into more of a cattle ranching or for a while a sheep ranching area, which changed the environment considerably. Now we're up uh, north of there, uh, near the town of Blocksburg, uh, way back in the back country. Uh, you may have gone there sometime. You can take a road that takes you through Alder Point and Blocksburg and Bridgeville and Neyland. And here in the early 1900s, some of the local Indians, uh, probably from the Nongadal tribe, although they might have been uh, Lassic Indians from nearby, they have come back uh, to uh, re inhabit an area where for a long time it was unsafe for them to live. And uh, uh, in the Southern Humboldt area, they uh, didn't create the houses that we've seen up here for Indians, like at Sumeg or like out at Hoopa or at Requa, where they used the redwood slabs and had these kind of massive, very permanent structures. Down in the South, they built these smaller conical, almost teepee-like shape uh, structures, and they would cloud them with bark, but by the time this building was uh, put up, they actually had uh, cut lumber that they could gather. And this was their very small place that they could stay in in the wintertime inside. And the, the shape is very similar to what they'd always used, but the outside material is different. And uh, here we are up on the divide called, it's called Mail Ridge. It's the big ridge line that runs between the south fork of the eel and the main fork of the eel. And we're up very near the top of that ridge. And uh, when I took this photo, I was looking east, way off in the distance is uh, Trinity County, way back here in the clouds are the uh, Yolabali Mountains. This is Palm Peak, and the main Eel River is down below it. And so over here is Trinity County, and in the foreground is Humboldt County. Down at the bottom of this ridge line is Alder Point. Gives you some idea of what another tribe, uh, what they would have for their terrain and they could live in. Uh, just many, many oaks out there and uh, the acorns along with salmon and other fishes were their two main staple foods. And it was an area that was very abundant in both of those. And of course they also had big game and berries and uh, edible bulbs uh, from uh, various uh, summer wildflowers. So uh, most of the Indians in these areas did pretty well. The Lassics uh, sometimes did have lean years. They said there was one year they faced starvation before the whites came. But for most of the time, uh, you're much better off if you could be up here in Humboldt County than in other parts of the state because there was such a wealth of uh, various food available. Here's Jenny Young, a member of the Sinkione tribe. And I call her a survivor. Well, of course, 
just about any of those early day Indians would have to be called survivors because uh, it was uh, often the case where uh, they were in danger of being killed at almost any time. Uh, Jenny's uh, parents were killed in a massacre uh, at Shelter Cove, probably in the late 1850s or early 1860s, but uh, she managed to survive that. We don't know the exact circumstances. And she was uh, living in the Bryceland area for quite a period of time. And this photo was taken when uh, this man, Pliny Goddard, interviewed her in the early 1900s. So that's a real quick look at the Southern Humboldt Indians book. Now we'll do uh, Southwest Humboldt hinterlands. I divided uh, the south part of the county into two sections uh, for the next uh, two books that I did. Uh, southwest means that we're in the drainage of the Matol River or the South Fork Eel. And so there's uh, 24 chapters in this book that cover uh, all the communities in those areas. And uh, sometimes it wasn't even a major community. It might've only had a school uh, or maybe uh, not much more than that, but it was enough to qualify in my mind to get its own chapter, mostly had to do with having enough information about the place. Um, I should mention that in all of these books, these three books, all of the uh, photos in them are colored and they didn't start out that way, most of them, but I was able to colorize them. For example, the cover of the book here as a black and white photo of Bryceland, a uh, town about oh, eight or 10 miles west of Garberville. Uh, and this photo was probably taken in the early 1900s, but uh, by colorizing it, it uh, seemed to very effectively separate the different buildings and make them stand out and give you more of a sense of what things are really like. Uh, just like this uh, photo on the back cover, which shows the original Redwood Highway in the Eel River Valley, probably uh, in Northern Mendocino County or Southern Humboldt. And imagine having to drive that road in the early days, gravel and uh, no guardrails. Uh, it was supposed to be two lanes wide, but just barely. And what if it was a foggy night or rainy or you start having some rocks dropping down on the road? It would have been a much more exciting trip to take in those days than it is now, although We've certainly had to deal with situations along uh, the Eel River that have also been difficult. So uh, in this book, we start out over near the coast and go south all the way to the Mendocino County line, then go over to the east a little bit and go down the south fork of the Eel. So uh, starting off, uh, I have a chapter on uh, Bear River, uh, which is the, the first major stream south of the Eel as you go along the coast. And there's a big ridge line between Ferndale and Bear River. And it's this ridge line here that's called Bear River Ridge. And uh, back in the late 19th century, down here, either on the ridge or over to the left down in the valley or canyon of Bear River, there were over 80 different uh, ranches or farms. They were all dairy farms and they were all producing cheese, if you can believe that. It was the area in Humboldt County where all the cheese was made and it had quite a reputation. All the logging camps would uh, want to buy Bear River cheese and uh, they were bringing it up by wagon all the way to Humboldt Bay. And uh, eventually the uh, nexus of cheese making shifted from this area into uh, the Eel River bottom and then also up by uh, Arcata and Arcata bottom there. But in the very early days, this was the place where you would go to get your cheese or where you would make it. And uh, there's actually a road that takes you down along this ridge into the Bear River Valley. And on the way you go through various ranches. This one here is called Green Pond Ranch. It's one of about, uh, 18 or 20 ranches that the Russ family had out there, each with its own dairy operation. And if you got down in the valley itself, uh, near the mouth of Bear River, or actually at the mouth, you would have seen this in 1915. I, I, I always liked this story because this was a ship that ran aground there at the mouth of Bear River, and it happened to be named the SS Bear, the Steamship Bear. 
So I think that uh, maybe it was actually trying to migrate like a salmon up the Bear River, its namesake river, but it didn't make it very far. It got stuck right here at the mouth. And uh, at first, the owners of the ship thought maybe it wasn't uh, stuck on the sandbar uh, too deeply. And if they threw out its cargo, maybe they could float it free. And in fact, you see over here at the left of the photo, a couple of cables where I think they were hoping to pull the boat free. But first they uh, empty a lot of its cargo. And what we see out here on the beach are uh, two of the major things that they had uh, stored on the ship. And uh, one of them are these boxes here, which contain uh, condensed milk, powdered milk. Uh, and of course, you had to add water to that, and then you got milk. And I don't know if you can see it down here, but each box says, keep in a cool, dry place. And of course, these were all thrown into the ocean, hardly, well, it was a cool place, but it was hardly very dry, and they washed up on shore. And I think in a couple of cases here, you might see where the milk is already kind of uh, re-liquefied and is trying to come out of the boxes. These other things, these bizarre cylinders, are actually rolls of newsprint that were used by the printing presses for newspapers. And uh, they weighed a lot, or, you know, they weighed, I think each of these weighed about a ton. And uh, so they threw out uh, dozens of these into the ocean and they thought, oh, they'll float back, you know, on shore and we can salvage them. Well, they weren't paying attention and they threw it out uh, during an ebb tide and as they watched, it looked like all the paper was going to float over to Japan. But uh, it turned out that then the tide shifted and it washed it back on shore. And there's quite a story that I won't have time to tell you, but was, uh, newsprint was salvaged and actually brought up to Eureka. And for a long time, it was a source of uh, paper for a, a company that got started just using uh, the salvage material from the wreck of the bear. So then you go down the coast, uh, you're, you could take the Wildcat Road out of Ferndale and uh, go over Bear River Ridge and go down to uh, Cape Town and Bear River and go over another ridge and go along the ocean for a little ways. And then you come inland to uh, one of the larger uh, communities, very small as it is, but uh, in the early days, one of the major communities in Southern Humboldt, Petrolia. And here we see it probably around uh, 1900. Um, it got its name because uh, they had discovered oil out there and uh, um, a collection of uh, uh, investors decided that they wanted to corner the oil market and they bought up uh, mineral rights or oil leases on a bunch of the property. And then they bought a section of flat area uh, near the Matoll and actually subdivided it and named it Petrolia and started a little town there and never got real big because they could never successfully uh, extract enough oil to make things worthwhile. The, uh, they had a number of wells there and they spent a lot of money drilling for oil, but the most successful well that they ever had out there uh, in its entire lifetime produced a total of 100 barrels of oil. So that's not a way that you're gonna make any money. And uh, even a century later, they were still sometimes hoping that they could strike a gusher out there and make a bunch of money on it, but it never happened. And I think now people uh, are no longer very hopeful about Petroleum living up to its name. Well, Big thing they did make money out in that area, in addition to ranching, was the harvesting of tan bark from the tan oak trees. Because up until about 1950, you needed a source of tannin when you wanted to tan leather. And the tan oak, uh, as its name implies, had a lot of tannin in its bark. And so they'd send out crews like you see here in the springtime or just right before start of summer, and they would go out and they would uh, cut down uh, the mature tan bark trees, which can get pretty big. Some of them can get over 100 feet tall. And you can see this one's about four feet in diameter. And they would strip the bark off of it, as you see here, uh, and uh, leave the bark out during the summertime where it would lose a bunch of its moisture. And then it would kind of curl up into a roll, like a scroll of parchment, something uh, in the shape 
uh, similar to that. And then they'd come back in the late summer, early fall, gather this up and uh, bring it into places like Bryceland and Shelter Cove where it could be processed and then sent down to tanneries in the Bay Area and the Central Valley. Uh, we even had uh, two or three tanneries up here. There was a tannery in our Cata, very near the co-op market. And there was a tannery uh, out uh, near Freshwater Corners. And I think uh, there was a third one somewhere, but I can't remember where that was. Uh, and uh, then uh, all over sort of central California, there were other leather tanneries. And then around 1950, uh, they developed synthetic uh, tanning agents and they no longer uh, needed to use the bark uh, from the tan oak tree. But by then, almost all of the mature tan oaks in uh, uh, Humboldt County and surrounding areas have been cut down. And it's very hard today to find a mature tan oak tree, anything like the size of this. There's a spot or two in Humboldt Redwood State Park uh, where the tan barkers never got to the mature trees and you can still see some of the real tall ones, but mostly you see much shorter ones that are kind of understory plants in other areas. Here's the Shelter Cove dance band in the 1930s when they were doing a lot of commercial fishing there. And on the weekends, they would uh, have dances uh, down at Shelter Cove. And uh, here's a, the four piece orchestra or band that they had that played there. Uh, I'm always fascinated by a guy here on the right, uh, Salvatore Pizzamente. And he, his day job was he was the salmon splitter. He weighed 247 pounds, and he was a powerful looking guy, as you can see, though he's playing this dainty mandolin. And uh, during the day, he would split the salmons in two, and then there was another guy that would gut the salmons, and they'd be able to process you know, thousands of these fish every day. But on the weekends, they'd have a dance, and he, along with the rest of this group, would play. And every once in a while, he'd take a break, and he had a dance partner, who weighed over 200 pounds herself. And they were both apparently very graceful dancers, but together they weighed close to 500 pounds. And so all the other dancers would just kind of stand aside and let them uh, do their dance thing. Uh, because if uh, you bumped into them, you would probably be flattened. And here's uh, what the little community looked like back in those days. Their, uh, their wharf was very active and there was a uh, store and off and on there was a hotel, but not too many buildings. There was a ranch. They actually had a working ranch out here. And uh, after the depression hit in the 1930s, they closed down the fishing uh, operation, commercial fishing. And only after World War II was the community uh, revived as a sports fishing area. Here we moved over to the uh, Eel River. Um, this is a south fork of the Eel, oh, two miles or so above the Benbow Inn. And this is Albert Smith and his wife, Sally Smith. Uh, Albert was one of the survivors of the Indian, well, they both were survivors of Indian genocide. Albert had been born five or six miles from here, and uh, he came back once it was safe to live here again. And uh, he and Sally actually uh, lived here on the banks of the South Fort, where there had been a village belonging to his uh, Tokubi Kia tribal group, which had been... Uh, destroyed by the whites, but uh, he was able to return very closely to his home. And a number of the Indians who survived the, the Holocaust of the mid 1800s were able to come back and find a place at least nearby where they uh, had been born and grown up and they could live there. And actually it's uh, Albert and Sally that you see on the cover uh, photo in the Southern Humboldt Indians book. So uh, here we're in downtown Garberville and it's probably late 1920s, early 1930s. And this is the Redwood Highway, which used to come right through town. It uh, got to Garberville as a road you could drive on, barely drive on in about 1917. And within a few years, uh, it actually became much more drivable. That made a big difference uh, to the area. Garberville had not been much of a town until then. Uh, in fact, 
Briceland, where they had the, the tan bark uh, industry operating, it was a bigger town for a while. But once the highway came through, Garberville was the first main community you'd reach as you came up from the Bay Area. And you could stop at places like Knapp's Restaurant over here, where they have the bottle of milk and they command you to eat. And uh, after a while, uh, Mr. Knapp, who uh, operated the restaurant, thought that uh, the milk uh, bottle wasn't an appealing enough sign. So instead, he uh, cut out a piece of wood and painted it and fashioned a coffee cup up here. And then this was really ingenious. He ran a, a pipe from his kitchen up to uh, the sign and it went through the center of the sign and the pipe actually uh, connected uh, to the stove in the kitchen and he was able to pipe steam up and it looked like uh, with the coffee cup, which you don't see here, but uh, was here later on. Uh, it looked like we had a steaming cup of coffee and uh, I think that was a more effective uh, attractant than the milk. Whoa. Well, I'll go the other way here. If you go north from Garberville, um, in fact, from Garberville itself, you see this jagged toothed uh, mountain in the distance to the north, the Bear Buttes up here. And uh, it's a remote, rugged area. It's one of the high locations in south central Humboldt County. Uh, in the book, uh, I have quite an account about L.K. Wood, Louis uh, Kaiser Wood, who uh, was a pioneer settler, white settler in the Arcadia area. In fact, there's L.K. Wood Boulevard that goes in front of uh, Cal uh, Poly Humboldt. And uh, he had a story about being attacked by several bears up here and being seriously injured. Well, it turns out that his story probably wasn't true. And uh, you'd have to look at the Bear Buttes chapter in the book to find out why. But I have a whole section in there with uh, some uh, newspaper articles about a bear attack occurring in a very different place than the Bear Buttes. And it may have been wood that was attacked, but it doesn't look like uh, he was attacked here. So I hope I've aroused your curiosity enough that you'll go and check that out. Ray Jerome Baker was a professional photographer in the early 1900s, and he uh, hung out in Southern Humboldt. In fact, uh, he and his wife had a place north of Phillipsville. And this looks like a bicycle, but it's actually motorized. He called it a motorcycle. And he would take it in these remote areas where it was difficult to drive, and a uh, car at least, and uh, take wonderful pictures of the countryside or of people there. And a lot of times, like in this photo, he would have the bike visible to let you know that was kind of his signature, that uh, this photo was by Baker and he'd uh, taken it as he had ridden his bike out there. And uh, very near the house that he lived in near Phillipsville, uh, there was another place, a rental, the Indian family lived in, the Merrifields. And while Baker was there, he took this wonderful uh, family portrait of all the people arranged by size in descending order uh, at a time when they all look fairly happy uh, and uh, looks like things might be going okay for them. Of course, uh, they'd had their hard times already as survivors of what had happened in the 19th century. And it turned out uh, uh, the family continued to suffer uh, the effects of prejudice and the effect of uh, not having uh, uh, much of an income, uh, but the, this particular period uh, in time, they were doing somewhat better. And it seems to me to be a, a wonderfully posed uh, image of those people. And here I think might be, uh, I'm not sure if Baker was just on a bicycle here or not, but I think he took this photo up on the ridge top above the South Fork Eel. Uh, I find this a, a really good example of what the homesteaders might have lived in around 1900 or a little before, a little after, because you can get 160 acres and try to turn it into a ranch, but uh, that was hardly enough acreage to make a living on. And a lot of these places were lost for taxes or the people just gave up and moved away. But here a family by the name of Duckett are trying to make it there with uh, their home-built cabin where they've uh, made the shakes and they even have a, a chimney that's probably 
mud on the inside and then the wood uh, shingles on the outside. And each of the little ducket girls here, they each have their baby goat with them. Um, the ducats were related to the Hunter family and Judge Hunter, who lived, uh, had a cabin, not more than a cabin, but a whole ranch out here, was actually quite wealthy. And uh, his house in Eureka was a uh, large mansion. You actually see it today, cat a corner from the municipal auditorium. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is an area called Salmon Creek. And then if you go back down to the main e or South Fork Eel from that and go down river, oh, five miles or so, you get to Myers Flat. And this is back when the Myers family were quite prominent there. The man here in front of the gas pump is a Ulysses S. Grant Myers, who was a member of that family. And uh, the store was owned by uh, G.F. Cloney, who's the fellow standing in the doorway here. But this was right on the Redwood Highway. And uh, it uh, today would be on the Avenue of the Giants because they've uh, converted the old uh, highway into that. And the store isn't here anymore, but there still is a small store in Myers Flat that takes the place of this one. Uh, Grant Myers, uh, I, I just have to tell you, he... Um, uh, like to have a few nips of whiskey in the afternoon and didn't always have the money to pay for it. So when he did have a little money, he bought a tin sheriff's badge, one of those star six pointed stars and it said sheriff on it. And he, he got one of those and he pinned it on his shirt and then he wore a jacket over that. And when he was really thirsty, especially on the weekends, he'd go and stand by the roadside behind one of these redwood trees, just a little ways outside of town. When he heard a car coming, he would uh, time his entrance. And when the car got really close, he would jump out from behind the tree and the car would have to screech to a halt to avoid hitting him. And then he'd walk up and he'd quickly pull his coat flap open and show the sheriff's badge. And then he'd close it up again and he would tell the motorist who was already a little shook up by all of this that uh, the fellow had been speeding and uh, that uh, he was going to have to go to court and the court didn't meet until Monday. This was Saturday when he'd stopped this fella. And so you're going to have to stay over here. And conveniently enough, uh, the Myers had the Myers in and you could stay there if uh, you needed to. But if you didn't want all of that expense, you could make bail. And it was a five dollar fine. And if you just handed it over to the, me, the sheriff, Grant Myers, I would take that to the court on Monday and pay your bail and you wouldn't have to stay over. And uh, so uh, all the motorists were just happy to get out of town after that. And they'd hand over their five bucks and drive off. And as soon as they'd left, uh, Grant would come over to Myers store and he'd get his five dollar bottle of whiskey and uh, be all set for the weekend. And uh, just down the South Fork from there is the town of Weot. And uh, actually, most of that area had been covered with redwoods. But uh, uh, right there, when uh, they put the highway through and you had access uh, to a roadway and you also had access to the railroad, which had come through by then, uh, some uh, speculators brought, bought small sections of land very near the roadway and cut down the redwoods there and split them up into things like redwood uh, railroad ties and fence posts and grape stakes. And then all they needed was a small truck and they could take it over to the railroad station at South Fork, about five miles away, and uh, send it by train down to the Bay Area, like to the Napa Valley for the grape stakes or uh, actually, they sold a lot of their uh, railroad ties just to the railroad itself. And so after they'd been at work for a while, they had cut out all the redwoods around here. You can see a few young growth trees sprouting back up here in the 1930s. But uh, eventually the Save the Redwoods League and the Humboldt Women's Save the Redwoods League were able to step in and they managed to protect some of the trees like this grove we see in the background. And if that hadn't happened, we probably would wind up having very few redwoods along the Avenue of the Giants, uh, where today there's a number of uh, small 
uh, dedicated groves as you go between uh, Garberville area and Scotia. A big side canyon that went into the South Fork near its mouth was Bull Creek. In fact, the, that's a major part of Humboldt Redwood State Park. In the 1930s, uh, this very small mill was operating there, and one of the owners was Irving Wrigley, that some of you folks might remember from 20 or 30 years ago. He had a big apple orchard out on Elk River, and I remember in the fall, you would drive out there uh, almost all the way to uh, where Falk used to be, turn off and go to his place, and uh, you'd buy a box or a bag full of apples there, but... Uh, before Irving was in that business, he was actually uh, cutting redwood timber in the Bull Creek area. And then down at the mouth of the South Fork, you had uh, the little town of Dyerville. It's all gone now. There's just a picnic area there, and it's where they staged the Avenue of the Giants Marathon. Uh, but uh, before the highway went through, uh, it was a pretty important stopping place because the only way you got across the South Fork was by a ferry and it didn't always run or you couldn't get across at certain times. So you had a store, that's the white building here. You had a hotel up here on the hillside. You had a livery stable, everything you needed for the travelers along here uh, until the highway came through. When it came through, it actually took out several of these uh, buildings and gradually uh, more of them were either washed away by floods or removed. And nowadays, uh, all you have there are a couple of uh, restrooms. Okay, now we'll finish up the, the program with Southeast Humboldt Hinterlands, the, the third book in this series. This one's over uh, to the east, of course, in Southern Humboldt, and uh, it covers the main Eel River and the Van Dusen River and the streams that feed into that. And for the cover of this one, this is the old town of Shively, which was uh, very, well, it's very hard to get to today and not much uh, there anymore, except for some agriculture operations. But back around 1910, it was a very important place because the railroad was coming through here. It's uh, across the main eel from Pepperwood. And uh, you can see back here, this is Stockel's uh, hotel where some of the workers stayed. And uh, so, for, oh, maybe eight or 10 years, it was kind of a boom town because workers who were building the railroad uh, would stay there. And then later it became a resort area because the rail line went through. Well, if we go way, way up into the extreme southeastern corner of Humboldt County, we get to the little town of Harris up uh, near the divide between the main eel and the South Fork. And back in the 1880s, 1890s, it was sheep country, and they harvested a lot of wool from the sheep. And here up near one of the hotels on the main road that went through there, you can see these huge bags of wool that are uh, being put on a wagon and uh, probably be uh, taken to be shipped out of Humboldt County. Um, and then the railroad came along and uh, it had a choice. They could uh, either go up the South Fork Eel or the Main Eel, but it was decided that the Main Eel was the better route. And uh, what that meant was that a few years later, when they wanted to put the highway in, it had to take uh, the second base best route and go up the, or down the South Fork Eel. But even here, going up the Main Eel, um, I like using this photo because it shows you how rugged it is. We're between Fort Seward and Alder Point on the rail line. And I think, uh, in fact, this is, I believe, Steelhead Creek, maybe about halfway between those two towns. And there's not much room for anything going up this canyon. It, it's very steep sided, very rocky. They managed to carve out a right of way for the rail line here on the south side of the river. But obviously, there's not room for anything else there. You couldn't also try to put a highway in here if you had just one of the two transportation corridors, that was all you're gonna be able to do. And uh, because the railroad got started first, uh, they were able to use this canyon. And like I said, the, the South Fork Eel had to become the, the route for the highway. Well, when they put in the railroad, uh, some speculators decided that they would turn Fort Seward into, uh, as their 
promotional propaganda put it, uh, the second largest city in Humboldt County. And uh, started off, they built this beautiful craftsman style uh, stone and shingle hotel, the hotel fort right next to the rail line. In fact, this photo might have been taken almost from the tracks. And it was just the hop, skip and a jump away from the railroad station. Uh, well, it turned out that uh, people uh, enjoyed coming up on the train and a few people stopped to stay here, but there wasn't much else to do at Fort Seward. Uh, you could, uh, if you want to go out and fish a little in the Eel River, but uh, there were no cultural activities. Uh, you were very far from any other community and uh, it made a little money for a little while and eventually it uh, stopped functioning as a hotel and was turned into a dormitory for loggers who were cutting um, Douglas fir out there in the 1950s and 60s. And during that period of time, it burned to the ground. And uh, I went out there on a railroad excursion once and what was left was a good part of the stone foundation. In fact, we had a catered lunch out there where we ate on uh, the remnants of that foundation. Then you keep going down the rail line. Um, you're now uh, getting down close to Camp Grant and South Fork and Dyerville. You've uh, come through a good part of the Eel River Canyon and uh, there was a small community established there. For a while, it was just called Young's because the Young family had a store, right, uh, where the uh, rail line kind of separated from the wagon road that went uphill here. And uh, they it was uh, pretty busy for a few years. But once again, when the railroad continued building and got completed, uh, it wasn't as active a spot. And so eventually the Young's store closed and they changed the name. Nowadays it's called McCann, M-C-C-A-N-N, because -N, a fellow by the name of McCann had a, a small lumber mill there that took uh, was there later than the Young store outlasted Young's. And up on the hills east of McCann, we've left the Eel River Valley now, but we're on the old first county wagon road that went through the hills. And we're at the little town of Blocksburg, which for a while was a really busy place. And reason why, it, well, one reason why it was really busy, here we have all these bags of wool again. Now they aren't on wagons, they're just on pack mules, but they're gonna take, be taken out of the area. In fact, Ben Blocksburger, the man that the town of Blocksburg was named for, was actually a wool merchant and he would uh, buy or bid on the different um, ranch uh, production of wool and uh, then uh, be in charge of seeing that they were shipped out of the area. And you see here, they've got a pretty good sized load. So this is a place where a lot of the ranchers made a lot of money for a number of years when uh, the price of wool was quite high. And then the federal government dropped a tariff on wool, they used to prevent imported wool from like New Zealand and Australia from coming into the country because they charged the high tariff on the imports. And then in the 1890s, they dropped that tariff and all of a sudden, Australia and New Zealand were sending in wool at a cheaper price than uh, the locals wanted to sell for. And some of these ranchers who'd been spending their time in the saloons and uh, gambling away their money uh, went bankrupt because they hadn't paid off their mortgages and they thought the good times would last forever, but they didn't. And uh, gradually, Bloxburg diminished as an important town. And today, if you go through Bloxburg, uh, I think all you'll find is a, a, a abandoned school or closed school, uh, a church and a post office and a cemetery. And uh, so you don't see much uh, wool and you don't see any gambling any stores, anything like that anymore. And then if you're up on the divide between the main eel and the South Fork, where there's another road uh, that uh, went uh, along the ridge line, uh, you could go through the Fruitland area. And uh, that was a big agricultural area that uh, never quite fulfilled its potential. There's quite a lengthy story in the, the book about uh, how that 
enterprise failed in the early days, but there was enough of a community there that they built the Excelsior School that you see here probably in the 19, about 1940. And uh, it's not doing too well in this picture and it shut down after a while, but it's still there. At least it was last time I was up a few years ago. And you see it right by the side of the Dyerville Loop Road if you drive by. I think uh, it's now uh, used as a private residence. Then jumping back down to the eel, and we're going down the eel river now. Um, we come to Larrabee Creek, it's a very large stream, almost a river in size, and you can see here, uh, starting up by Blocksburg in the hills, and it comes out and uh, just off camera here, it joins the main eel. And we're probably here about 1910. And Mercer Fraser Company, which is still in business here in Humboldt County, is building the railroad trestle across Larrabee Creek. And you can see that they're doing that with the help of one of these steam donkeys, the same kind of machine that they used out in the redwood logging operations to help move uh, redwood logs into areas where they could haul them away. And this engine is powering a pile driver here, which is driving these uh, piles into the riverbed uh, to form part of the trestle. And uh, that bridge is uh, still there, but it hasn't been used in uh, 25, about 25 years since the railroad shut down. And uh, very nearby on the other side of the eel is what used to be called a home flat or sometimes just called Holmes. And the Holmes Eureka Lumber Company, which had a big mill uh, in Eureka in back of the Bayshore Mall, uh, logged this flat, all of this area here, in the early 1900s. And these were the little cabins they built for their logging crew to live in while they were there. I think it took about six years before they logged off this entire flat. And then uh, when they left, uh, this was the residue, the, the cabins with no workers anymore. Uh, a lot of places where they logged, they just left things alone. And eventually in the early days, even without planting new trees, uh, there was a regrowth and uh, you started getting a second crop of redwood timber coming in. But uh, the Holmes Eureka Company did something different. They actually subdivided this big flat that had been covered with huge redwoods and uh, sold ranch parcels to people or ranchettes. They were small, like five acres or so, but somebody could buy a parcel there and they either have several big stumps on their property or they could remove them, which was difficult and sometimes dangerous. But if you go down there today, you find a lot of uh, houses and little small ranch-like uh, properties there, all built on this area where they'd had uh, a stand of very uh, vigorous uh, old growth redwoods. Going down uh, the eel a little farther and crossing over to the west side, here we are in Pepperwood. You can go by Pepperwood today on the Ave near the Giants, and there's a couple of uh, little hiking trails in there. And there's usually a produce stand or two open in the summer. Well, this is right after the 1955 flood. And uh, it wasn't as bad as the 64 flood, but look what it did here. Here's a couple of houses, maybe a gas station building. Here's a gas pump. And they're out blocking the road. They were just washed off their foundations out into the middle of the road. And so uh, there had to be a lot of reconstruction and rehabilitation after 1955 to get things back in shape in Pepperwood. But uh, most of the people uh, who were there then stuck it out. They rebuilt or, or redid their properties. And then nine years later, they had the 64 flood and it washed out almost everything. And so uh, almost all the residents left at that point in time. And you've never had a, a business community there uh, since then. Now we jumped over to the Van Dusen River and we're at Carlotta. So if you were going out on Highway 36, you'd go through Hydesville, then you'd drop downhill after two or three miles and cross a, a big stream called Yager Creek. And then you come to the business district. Some of you might remember that 10 or 15 years ago, 
Seamus T-Bone got started out here in this very building at the corner uh, before they got big and famous and moved into uh, Eureka. But uh, nowadays, you really have no business district. You have a, a three or four of the old business buildings out there. And this is about where the highway would come and then make a big turn and head south. But uh, as you can see, back around 1920, it wasn't a very busy place. It was uh, on the route, though, if you wanted to get out to uh, Trinity County. Uh, in fact, it was uh, a way that you could get over to the Central Valley uh, by going uh, on the route of Highway 36. And uh, for a number of years, if you were in central Humboldt County, that's how you'd have to go east because they did not complete uh, Highway 299 until the late 1920s. And Highway uh, 36 was actually an earlier route, uh, the first route you could use to get over into the Central Valley. And out along there, Strong Station was a stopover. It was maybe eight miles or so east of Carlotta. And here's the building in the background, but I just love the photo. I have no idea what these boys have been up to here. It might've been a kind of rowdy roadhouse type place. Uh, it had overnight accommodations, but it had a restaurant. And uh, Andy Genzoli, the newspaper man said that there were some bullet holes in the building where things had got rowdy once in a while. And I could see where if these boys had had a few uh, too many beers or whiskeys, uh, they might be willing to shoot up things themselves. That's all gone now. You can hike down to where it used to be and you actually can see where the old highway was. There's some pavement and uh, there's even a white or yellow line along the center, but uh, the buildings at Strong Station are long gone and the highway now goes on the hillside up above it. If you kept going another 10 miles, 12 miles maybe, you got out to Bridgeville and it lived up to its name because it had a bridge, many years, a covered bridge across the Van Dusen River. And here'd be the road over here on the right, coming up from Strong Station, Hydesville, and all those places. And then when you got here, you'd make a turn to the south and go across the Van Dusen on this bridge. And on the other side, you could either go straight ahead, that would take you to Blocksburg and Harris and all these places in southeastern Humboldt County, or you could take a left turn, and that's the way you went out to Trinity County. You go through Larrabee Valley and Dinsmore and places like that. Or if you didn't want to do either of those things, you could make a left turn here and go up this road, and that would take you up to um, Iaque and Neeland and back down to Freshwater. And all of that was part of the uh, first wagon road that they had going out of Humboldt County. Well, on your way up to Iaque, if you made that left turn and was leaving Bridgeville, you go near the Showers Pass area. And this is a pretty exciting story, at least I thought it was. So I wrote it up for the book. Up in the 1930s, in this very remote uh, area above the Mad River, uh, there were some ranchers and there was a store and a school, not too much else, and a lot of snow. And so in the middle of the winter, this man here, Ralph High Rock Gordon, uh, wanted to uh, mail some letters at the post office. And he was uh, having to come in from his ranch, which was uh, over to the north near the Mad River. And uh, the mail carrier had already come to the Showers Pass post office and they were waiting around. And they heard a gunshot and they're coming from the north. And uh, the folks there said, well, that's probably High Rock letting you know that he's on his way because he you know, wants to drop off some mail. And so they waited around for a while for High Rock to show up and he didn't. So a couple of the boys went out to see what was going on and they found High Rock, but he was there kind of half buried in the snow and there was a big pool of blood staining this, uh, uh, the snow nearby. And he actually uh, had tried to get his gun out, but he fumbled it and he shot himself in the leg. And uh, it was a very serious wound. And he was just there kind of slowly bleeding away. So they managed to bring him into the store. And uh, there's uh, five feet of snow or so on the ground everywhere around there. And it's uh, by trail, it's a dozen to 15 miles just to get to Bridgefield. Well, they uh, uh, sent out 
the messenger got down to Bridgeville where there's a phone and they phoned and they said, we need a doctor out here. And they hunted around and no one wanted to do it. And finally, Sam Beret, that the Beret Center is named for, um, uh, volunteered. He was just new as a doctor. And he said, well, I'll go out and do it. Only problem was he didn't know how to ride horses. And from Bridgeville on, uh, like I say, about 15 miles, you had to go through the snow on horseback. So he got his first lesson in the saddle riding out there. And he got there and uh, High Rock was there. He's still alive, but he was feverish and his wound had been infected. And Beret said, well, we got to get him into the hospital. I can't do enough for him here. And so this is what they were facing. You see the terrain there. So they uh, made a kind of sled using a piece of sheet metal for the runner on the bottom. And then they piled some wood on that. And uh, they had some hay uh, tucked into uh, a sheet to kind of make a bed. And they put them on top of it. And at first they tried moving them by horse. And they only made about a mile or two and the horses, well, first they tried actually pulling him uh, by hand and those guys gave out. Then the horses could only go a couple of miles at a time. And then they had the rest for a long time and they had to change horses. But after I think two nights and three days, they got him into Bridgeville. They got him to the hospital. He survived, he came back and everything was okay. But it was a pretty uh, dramatic uh, trip uh, during uh, the dead part of winter and almost a deathly winter for old High Rock. Now, now out in that same area uh, on the Bridgeville Neeland Road, you get to an area called the uh, Thousand Acre Field. And uh, as near as I could tell, it wasn't quite a thousand acres, but this is part of it. And it's mixed in. It's a lot of grassland, a lot of prairie. And they have a lot of uh, oaks out there also. And uh, the Niles family, Dewey Niles, had had a ranch uh, down near Lolita. And uh, he married Doris uh, Kildale, became Doris Kildale Niles, and became a very well-known educator up in this area. In fact, she actually got her pilot's license and uh, could fly into remote locations to uh, give presentations and do teaching. But they had the second ranch uh, out here uh, just off the Bridgeville Neeland Road. And this is one of the Merle Schuster photos that are available online at the Humboldt or the Cal Poly Humboldt website. And I colorized it to you know, make it green and tan instead of just black and white. But uh, you get some idea of what a lot of the terrain is out there. And uh, actually, part of that area is still in uh, the Niles family. Uh, Peggy Niles, the daughter of Doris and Dewey, uh, married John Rice, who I believe just died last year and had a very large ranch out in the Showers Pass area near where uh, High Rock Gordon had to make his trip. So that uh, gives us some idea of what the area is like in the Van Dusen drainage and what you would uh, read about in the Southeast Humboldt Hinterlands book. And that brings us to the end of the program. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to try to answer them. I'll mention, if you want to look at any of these books for free, or you can download them for free, if you go to the Cal Poly Humboldt Library website, and then on that site, they'll direct you to what's called the Press at Cal Poly Humboldt. And that's or actual press that prints books. They, they're the ones that have done all three of these books. But in addition to printing regular copies, they have electronic versions that you can uh, access through that website. And if you go to the, the site for me uh, that has my name on it, it has the four books of mine that they've published. And you can just click a button and you can get an ebook, an electronic version of the book in full color and have it on your own computer, or you can look at it online. And so uh, you can either do that, or if you want the books, you can certainly buy them. You can get them at the Historical Society and then uh, then also at the local bookstores. So I think that finishes this up. Thank you very much. And I'll take any questions if we have any listening. Yeah, if you guys could put your questions into the chat window, I'll go ahead and read them out. Um, there is one that asked how many deceased Native Americans during the genocide? What was the first part of that? How many deceased Native Americans during the genocide? How many? You know, we really, 
we can't tell for sure. You know, we just don't know how many of what the population was out here, and they've never been able to, you know, figure out what that number would have been before so many Indians were killed in the 50s and 60s. But I would say just as kind of a, a, a general ballpark figure that many of the tribes up here probably had somewhere between two to four or 5,000 Indians in each group. And if we use that figure down in Southern Humboldt, I wouldn't be surprised if we had um, eight to 12,000 Indians before they were attacked by the whites. And uh, within 50 years, those population numbers had dropped probably by about 90%. The combination of outright killing of the Indians and then uh, disease, illness that struck them, uh, you know, new um, diseases that hit them like smallpox. Uh, and then also the fact that uh, they no longer had access to their usual food sources. They were landless. They'd been driven off their land. And uh, they were just having to exist as best they could. So many of them lived in very difficult circumstances. And so it wasn't just the outright killing during the uh, genocide period, but it was uh, them being in uh, these dire straits for many years afterwards. And so by 1900, it looks like with a lot of these populations, you might have only had uh, 10 to 20 percent of the Indians still left alive. And then um, another question, what is the name of the professional photographer with the motorbike? Yeah, that's Ray, R-A-Y, Jerome, you know, J-E-R-O-M-E, Baker, B-A-K-E-R. And once again, if you go to the Cal Poly uh, Humboldt Library website, uh, you can go to their uh, photography collection and you can actually uh, sort by name and you can get uh, all of the Baker photographs. And they have a lot of Baker photographs there. You can... Uh, uh, look at them online and you can actually download copies of those for free if you like them. That's how I acquired a lot of the ones that I used and then colorized. And the same way with this photo right here, uh, there's over 2,000 of these aerial photos of Humboldt County from the 1940s through the 1960s that Merle Schuster did, S-C-H-U-S-T-E-R. And once again, you could sort uh, by name for him, and then say you wanted to find photos of uh, the Neeland area or uh, McKinleyville or just about any particular place, you could put in a, a location and the photographer's name, and then you'll get this drop down uh, list of the photos. And I have little thumbnails that will show you what the picture looks like. You can click on the thumbnail and look at it on screen and go one more step and they will uh, send you a file, electronic file that uh, has a copy of the photo. Great, and uh, speaking of this photo, we had a question. Um, they were wondering if this um, could be a landing strip on Niles, Rid Niles Ranch. Oh, well, could be. Uh, I've seen a few other aerials of the area, nothing I could identify as a landing strip, so I'm not sure about that. It's a big area with, and this is fairly flat, and I think it would have been possible. You know, the, the two areas out there I know of, of course, is the airport up at Neeland, which would be about 15 miles to the north, and then, of course, you had one out at Dinsmore. But uh, it's possible that there were landings out here. I've never read anything about it, though. Uh, okay, another question. Has anyone considered requesting that the name of Larrabee Creek be changed since it's named for someone who we may, may not want to honor with that place name? Well, this comes up every once in a while. And when it does, I usually come up with a list of offensive names and uh, his name is at the top of the list. Um, I, I think it's possible it could be changed. Uh, to do that, uh, my understanding is uh, it, you have to petition what's called the Board of Geographic Names, which is a federal board that makes decisions on these sorts of things. And they're notoriously conservative about changing names. And of course, it creates problems when they're doing maps and things like that, that you know, would have to be altered. But uh, there are ways to petition to have this happen. And uh, I think realistically, 
the the best chance uh, you have of having that happen is if the request comes from one or more of the Indian tribes, because uh, they actually have more clout in this area than I think uh, just a general member of the public does. And of course, they were the people that suffered the most at, well, they were the people that suffered, period, at Larrabee's hands. Uh, so there is a way to do that. And, uh, you know, approaching, uh, in this case, the Bear River Rancheria would be the the Indian, official Indian tribe that would have ancestral connections to this area out here uh, where Larrabee Valley is. Uh, so that would be one approach to take. Uh, sometimes they've been able to change names when it's on state property. You might remember that in the last couple of years, they changed the name of Patrick's Point to Sumeg, using the Indian name out there. And Patrick had been a man who had murdered a couple of Indian boys and actually fled the area because they were uh, going to take him to court about it. But, so he was another unsavory character like Larrabee. And uh, they also down in Humboldt Redwood State Park, uh, they changed the offensive name of Squaw Creek there. Uh, so they were able to do that because it was park property and they could uh, change uh, the name uh, uh, because they were the uh, controlling uh, group for that uh, uh, land. But if it's just out on private property, something like that, I think it always has to go to the Board of Geographic name. And in fact, uh, if it's just a landmark, I think even uh, something like Squaw Creek to become official on a map would, uh, like a geographic map, would have to be approved by the federal agency. Okay. Um, there was somebody who wanted to, they missed the name of the wealthy Eureka family that was related to the Ducats. Uh, the Hunters. Judge Hunter, I have his first name. I'm, I'm not remembering his first name right now, but uh, might have been Thomas Hunter. But anyway, uh, his house is still standing. It's a big gray Victorian. If you go to the Muni Auditorium and you're coming up out of Old Town uh, and you uh, go to the, you pass the Muni, you're on uh, F Street going south and you come to the next intersection, the Hunter house will be cat corner from the Muni's property on the southeast corner of F Street and I don't know what that is about ninth and it's a it's been converted into a series of apartments uh, but it was a formidable uh, Victorian for a number of years it has a square tower uh, three-story tower on one corner of it um, but I can't uh, I just can't remember his first name now I'm sorry but anyway, I think it might be Thomas Hunter, and uh, that's the property you'd want to look at if you were interested. Okay, well, it looks like that was um, all of our questions. Um, so I want to go ahead and thank all of you for joining us. Thanks, Jerry, for the presentation. And again, thanks to our sponsors, Carl Johnson and the Cutting Edge Hair Design. Um, and don't forget to join us uh, next month. I believe it will be live streamed from the Clark Museum, so you'll have the chance to see it live or um, just watch on YouTube and we will send that information out next month. Um, on that note, I'll say um, thank you to everybody and wish you all a good weekend. Thanks everyone. Thanks very much folks.